Hello and welcome to the award-winning Berg on the Freak podcast. This is episode 389. I'm throwing things up around a bit a little bit just to keep you guessing. I'm the bloke from Rugby League Project, Andrew Ferguson. You can find me on Twitter, at AndrewRP. Join me as always is the lucrative League Freak. You can also find me on Twitter, at League Freak. How you going there, mate? Kind of a big deal. This is known. I'm going all right. How are you doing, Andrew? Not too bad, not too bad. I've, I've spiced things up a little bit. I promise I'll, I'll I'll just sit back a little bit now and calm down a little bit. No, no you got to keep spicing stuff up. <laughs> i got to drag you into the realm of just being a fucking egotistical dickhead. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's the way to live, I'm telling you. It's great. Okay. Something tells me I don't think I'd have to go to too much great effort to get there. Yeah. Well, maybe. Always stroking your own ego. That's the thing, yeah. That's what they call it. Well, <laughs> speaking of egos, i got a uh, tweet during the week. Ah, yeah. Can I ask, actually? Yes, yes. What, what was the tweet that you tweeted? Okay, so the, the Rugby Football League and the Super League put out a joint statement talking about the realignment of the administration of the game in the UK. Now, we talked about this, what was it, about a month ago, three weeks ago, that the Rugby Football League and Super League we're going to create a third administration because having two administrations was just too confusing. Yes. And so uh, they put out their statement on March the 2nd, and I retweeted it, quote tweeted it, saying having two different administrations has been bad for the game. So what do they do? They make a third one. And I got a reply from the chairman of the Rugby Football League. What's his name, by the way? His name is Simon Johnson. I've never heard of him, but that's all right. You don't know everyone in the world, but his name is Simon Johnson. And he uh, he replied to me. He said, not three bodies. It's two with Super League not having any staff. <laughs> so Super League doesn't have any staff. So hang on. I don't know. Hang I don't on. know. Hang on. I've got, I've got to ask. Hang on. This is probably what you're going to say. How can it be two bodies if one of the bodies has no staff? I don't know. <laughs> the first thing I thought was, it, it, I was like, hang on a second. We know Super League does most certainly have some staff because they've put together some of the worst uh, commercial deals in the history of history. But then again, I thought to myself, uh, maybe them deals were done by nobody, you know, giving away the... They're naming rights to a lorry company for yeah. nothing, for some stickers on the side of trucks. Obviously, what happened is the, you know, the back and forth, the negotiations. Mm. It began with the sponsor sending an email to the uh, to the Super League saying, mm -hmm. "Here's our proposal. Hit us with what you want to do, and let's meet halfway somewhere." Mm. And then they never got a reply. And they went, "Let's just." Let's just change it and say we'll do it for free. Yeah. And in return, I don't know, you can just pay for stickers on the side of trucks, something like that. Or, you know, let's just give free pizza to the players. And no reply, come back. Oh, that's good enough for us. You know, we'll do out of the goodness of our heart, we'll do what we said we're going to do. Sorted. Yeah. Um, it, it's weird. I think if Super League honestly doesn't have any registered registered staff, it's probably a tax thing. That's all I could think. But anyway, moving forward, I replied to him, who's in charge of rugby league in the UK, Simon? Pretty honest question, yeah. you know. He said, the RFL. I said, who is the person that is in the top spot in rugby league in the UK? He didn't reply to it. So I said, who's the person in charge? Who's the boss of the game? Didn't reply to it. So, because I wanted him to say, well, you know what, it's, Ralph Rimmer or whoever. Yeah. Because then I would say, so you're saying that the other people uh, just have no power whatsoever. But he, he probably knew I was going to say that, so he didn't reply. I think I would be pretty right in saying that if somebody went to Super League and said the Rugby Football League's in charge, they'd probably just say, yeah, All right. I wonder if every single person that's running Super League is also on the board for the RFL. I don't know. I don't know. 
You know what? Thing, you can wear two thing. hats and pick up two paychecks, well, do one well, job. Well, look, here's the thing. You've got the Super League administration, you've got the Rugby Football League administration, and they've made this third administration. The reason they did that was so nobody lost their job. Because the one thing in Rugby League where the salary stays the same and nobody's job is ever in jeopardy are those board positions and the people that are within the administration of the Rugby Football League and Super League, right? That's been established. But here's what it comes down to. You and me are sitting here talking about the administration, we, I don't know who's in charge. Who's the boss? If I've got a billion dollars and I want to buy all of rugby league in the UK, who do I go to? I, I don't know. Who's the boss? We well, know if you're doing that. Isn't the third group that they created supposed to be dealing with the financial side of things? But can, but can you imagine going to that that group and saying, "Hey, I've got a billion dollars." Somebody says, "Oh, you don't talk to the, you don't talk to the rugby football league or super league. You talk to this other mob." So who the fuck's this other mob? And it's like, oh, there, there's just an administrative arm. Like, they've got no real power. <laughs> it's, fuck off. I've got money to spend here. I want to talk yeah. to the boss. Yeah. You just go, you know what? I don't think I can invest in this um, Mickey Mouse operation. It does seem like that. Yeah. So, um, you know, so, yeah, I'll, tell you what, I'll tell you what's funny, actually, you know, what you, what you were talking about there yeah. and the administrators looking after themselves in their own jobs. Yes. That's eerily similar to the issues that a lot of rugby union players had in Australia in the very early 1900s and a large reason why they wanted to create their own breakaway competition. Yeah. You know, they had administrators on big money sitting on trains in first class, smoking cigars and eating caviar and all sort of bloody fancy stuff. All the players in cattle class struggling to get by financially, yet they're the ones out there doing the graft on the field, drawing the people in, making the money for the game, and all that money's just going to the big wigs at the top. Yeah, and, like, I always look at it, I always think of it this way. When we have seen teams die, like, literally die midweek sometimes over in the UK, thankfully it hasn't happened for a few years now, we haven't seen anybody at the top of the game even lose one-twelfth of their salary that year. Meanwhile, the players have lost their contracts. Some of them have had visa issues. Some of them have been stuck in the UK because they're in complete limbo because now they're unemployed. Their visa was for a working visa, but they've, you know, they've settled down in the UK. We've seen terrible situations like that. Yep. No one, the Rugby Football League CEO, the chairman, they never lose their jobs ever, 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 ever. It's a disgrace. And to try bullshit. You know, that it's not a fucking joke that they had to make a third arm to to control the commercial assets of the game, please. We know in Australia that we've got the boss is Peter Volandis. We know that, for better or worse. If someone says who's in charge of rugby league in Australia, it's Peter Volandis. Who the fuck is the boss in the UK? Because you've got three administrations now. It's a fucking disgrace, and it's wasteful. It's wasteful of all the money that is brought into the game. They spend it on themselves. Do you reckon this third arm are in charge of the most important part of the of the game in England, and that is restocking the vending machines? Most likely. Maybe it's just a vending machine company, hey? Coca-Cola. Hey, you know what? I was reading about a dude that... Uh, Made all of his money in, you know the, you know in the UK how they they call them slot machines, but they're really like little game machines. Yes. Yeah, I was reading about a dude that did that, and I feel like he bought something weird. Oh, I wish I, I you know what I think it was. <laughs> was it Salford? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not that. I said it was weird, not stupid. Um, <laughs> no, he he bought. It was a guy who had bought. Um, a Formula One team in the 90s at one point. That's what it was. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, that's what it was. That's anyway. a sound investment. Well, it was one of those, it was like, you know, Pacific. It was one of those ones that was a back marker. Ah, yes. So, yeah, did his well, best. Well, before we move on to the news that you've got. Yes. Let me just uh, let people know about some international rugby league news that's happened because we actually have had our first international game of the year during oh, the week. Nice. Okay, what um, was it? It was in uh, Sydney at Pioneer Park. I don't know if anyone saw it or not, but uh, Chile beat the Philippines 36-20. to 20. Oh, nice. 
Um, Paul Sheedy, who used to play with the Melbourne Storm in the very early 2000s, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, pretty sure he might be early 40s now. Mm-hmm. He is still playing for the Philippines. Nice. He's been doing a lot of great work there since they, um, since they began. Mm-hmm. Um, also had a few other players from, you know, lower grades in the NRL. Uh, Daniel Vasquez from the Sharks. He's actually played one or two NRL games. He was, in, he was involved in the game as well. Um, there's, there's a few players that were getting around there. I just wish that games like this, when they're being played in Sydney, mm-hmm. somebody, anybody, Promote it harder and get some get some eyes out there. And you know, we managed to get Fox Sports to take cameras out to meaningless trial games. Why couldn't they have taken someone out to broadcast this game? Yeah, I would have watched it for sure. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I think I think that's the disconnect, isn't it? It's the disconnect between, say, and I, I look at it as Australia at the moment. But it's the disconnect between the Australian Rugby League administrative, the entire thing, and them having a connection to um, other rugby league organisations within Australia that are running around or purport to be international teams. Now, they are international teams, but it's not like they're playing in their home countries. They're playing in a a neutral country. And, uh, you know... It's a strange one. It would be nice if there were a curtain raised to an NRL game or something like that. I don't even know if that's possible, but, um, you know, something needs to be brought together with that. I always thought that the the international administration should be based in Brisbane and for this reason so that it could run all of those things and it be a an administration and and sort of bring together the, the different organisations and, and be able to go to the NRL and say, look, we've got this international game that's going to be on. Can we slot it into a, you know, a time slot there, you know, get Fox Sports to cover it and stuff like that. But, you know, that doesn't happen because the current international administration, apart from being a bit of a basket case and very uh, insular, they're very disconnected from the main part of the rugby league playing world, which is in this part of the world. Yes, it's they've got to do something different. It's yeah. starting to be run a bit like English rugby league. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, let's move on. Yes, so we've got some emails. Should we read out some emails? Oh yes, let's get some emails. How many have we got? We've got. I think we've got a few. I'll have to go through. I'll go through them one by one, and we'll see where we get to. Nice. Now, our our episode about the uh, redrafting is uh, the Super League competition has had a fair few people um, have something to say. Um, the first thing I've got a, a tweet from um, RL Chit Chat, and he basically lists the teams that he would like to see in a reorganised Super League competition. Yep. Um, the difference is he has the likes of Wakefield in it. He has a combined Cumbrian team. Um, he also makes Manchester from Salford. He has Hulk AR in there as well. Um, and he has some of the other teams that are not there that we named. So I, I thought that that was interesting. Um, and then we got an email from Ben. Um, and he says, Ahoy, lads. Ben from Simpsons NRL Memes. Legend. Listen, yeah, yeah. He's uh, one of our favourite followers. Um, listen to your episode on revamping of Super League. Since we're talking England, did you know that England has its own Tamworth that is almost just as shit as the Australian one? No. And we all know that we all know and love. This one has a, bre- this one has a breed of pig named after it. I think you lads, what, what one's he talking about? Bred a pig named after it. Yeah. Wow. Oh, do you know a pig? Do you know any breed of pig names? No, nah, pigs is not something that I had to deal with much, as, you know, in rural, mm. my rural upbringing. Horses, snakes, what was else? Ham, cows, bacon, bacon, pork chop. Porky. I think, I think I've covered all the different types of pig I'm aware of. Yeah, porky. Um <laughs> Self-censored. I okay. He goes. 
I think you lads were too kind with making it a 16 competition. I think stripper dance 12 teams for five or so years, obviously with no relegation or promotion. This will help raise the standard of play and allow the new teams to sign players initially. And these are the teams he has. There's only 12 of them, so I'll read them out. London Broncos, St. Helens, Wigan, Hull FC, Leeds Rhinos, Catalan Dragons, Toulouse, Newcastle Thunder, Amsterdam Cobras. Why not? North Wales, Cardiff Crusaders. Cardiff's actually in the south, though. Um, Salford, Manchester, Red Dragons. And Bradford Bulls, where's get Red Dragons from? They're the Red Devils. Don't know what he's doing there. Yeah. Anyway, he says Amsterdam is my left field choice to add to the competition. The Netherlands have been making some solid progress over the last few years, including their own amateur domestic competition. Amsterdam is close enough for English teams to travel to and provides an extra market to sell TV rights to. And who the hell doesn't want to go to Amsterdam for the weekend? Good point. <laughs> or 20, bruh. Uh, give the teams that didn't make the cut a list of expansion areas that if they relocate to would help their application for expanding to 14 teams in, say, Good five idea. or seven years' time. Yeah, it is. And then 16 teams after that. The list could include Dublin, Edinburgh, Glasgow, second London team, Birmingham, Nottingham, Bristol, or Sheffield. Keep up the good work, gentlemen. Nice. I don't mind what he suggested there. Yeah, yeah, that was pretty good. Now, let me find. Okay, Super League. This one is from Patrick. Uh, Patrick has written a very long email. As he does. Yeah, yeah. Patrick writes the longest emails to us. Should I read the whole thing out? Look, I I don't mind. Hey, guys. Enjoyed the podcast on the Super League Club Draft. It's an interesting topic that certainly creates a fiery debate. I'm an expansionist, but to successfully expand in any sporting competition, your heartland areas need to be secured where our potential growth growth is either close to or has maxed out. To put simply, you need a strong, secure base to effectively slash successfully expand into new territories. Unfortunately, or fortunately, whichever way you want to look at it, Elite level rugby league, a la Super League, has not come close to maximising its growth potential across the M62 regions. Do you reckon that's the case? Um, you know what? For the majority of the M62, I'd probably say yes. I mean, you think that there's not that great a competition in the Huddersfield region, like in the actual Huddersfield. Yeah. You've got to go sort of, you know, Leeds. Have, have made a bit more of a uh, name for themselves in both soccer and rugby league. Yeah. Huddersfield's done squat. Yeah, and that's the thing. I mean, how long does Huddersfield need? But then you go along a bit further and you've got Doncaster and, yeah. you know, Sheffield, places like that. And they haven't done a great deal in, on the sporting scene, really. They've not I – mean, I'm not saying they're, they're crap, but mm. they've just been loitering on that and, edge of, you yeah. know, two divisions and sort of going up and down in both soccer and rugby league, sort of hanging around that region there where they sort of, you know, they yo-yo. Yeah. Um, and, and they're that's, crap. That's not success. No. That's hanging on. No, yeah, exactly. Anyway, he says, a major asset Heartland Rugby League clubs across Northern England have is their traditional and historical brands. We're talking about some of the oldest sporting clubs in the world. That is some powerful IP you're dealing with. The problem with IP is if no one cares, no one cares. Yeah, and you know, with I mean, we just used Huddersfield again. When was the last time they won anything? Is was anyone alive when they saw that take place? And I'm not talking about the Challenge Cup. Mm. That's a luck of the draw type thing. And I'm not saying that in a derogatory way. I think the Challenge Cup is remarkable. They've managed to keep that not just relevant. But drawing the crowds it does, especially for the final, for essentially what is a midweek knockout comp, it dominates the sporting landscape there somehow. I don't know how, but Super League can't quite match it, especially when it comes to the final. They struggle. I find that fascinating. But, it, it, uh, yeah. Like, I th- you think a hut, like Huddersfield is where the game was formed on yeah. a day, and the Huddersfield name doesn't. You know, it doesn't resonate. No, it just doesn't. Um, 
really successful in the early 1900s. Uh, again, I think in the 30s and 40s, just before World War II, a little bit after World War II. That's it. Um, it's like it's, Wakefield Trinity, right? They once had a really good team. It wasn't when I've been alive, <laughs> but once upon a time they did have a team. But you know the name Wakefield Trinity, but who really cares? Yeah. Like, if and, somebody says, you know what, this was a really good team, like, you know, 20 years before you were born, what are, what are you supposed to do with that? And this is the thing, too. I think some teams are really good at harnessing that IP. Wigan, mm-hmm. even St. Helens, they're really good at using that because they're still relevant, still successful. Like, on the field, they still get the results on the field. Mm. But too many of these clubs aren't successful. And I think there's a hesitancy at times to talk about, you know, when their club was founded, because then it makes people think that, oh, so you've been shit since 1895, have you? <laughs> yeah, I, I I think I agree with you on that. You know, it's it's a weird one to be around for so long. I mean, we even had the problem with South Sydney, where South Sydney had won, like, what was it, 20 competitions? Yeah. And but they hadn't won a competition for decades, and so who cares? Who cares if you won twenty competitions and your last one was, you know, for anyone was alive that yeah. goes to your games? No one cares. It's nice, but if you're not relevant now, what does it matter? That's right. People only care about that history when it's the club is proud, and you yeah. only get pride when you're successful. Um, you know, I'm, and the the flip side. I tell you, the flip side. Penrith are the grand final winners last year. No one's talking about how they were absolutely putrid for the first, what, 15 years of their, 20 years, something like that. Like, yeah, 15 years, yeah. 15 years. They were not bad, putrid. Yeah, they were constantly hanging around the, the wrong end of the ladder and very much at the lower part of that <laughs> wrong end of the ladder. Yeah. They yeah. struggled to... And I think it was because at the time, too, it was hard to attract players to go that far away from the CBD. And so, yeah, and Penrith was very different. Like, Penrith was still a, a very small, out-of-the-way area at that point. It's changed a lot since. Yeah. Um, but yeah. It was a lot harder for them to attract anyone. Then they just had, just by luck of the draw, a few really good players come through in the early 80s mm. and some good juniors there, and they managed to hang on to them. Get a little bit of success and you can start to attract a few players. Next thing you know, you win a title and it doesn't take that long if you're doing things right. I also think the other thing that they sorted out and I don't know how it come about, but I mean, even when I was, I was a real young kid, Panthers Leafs club was massive. Like I don't know how they managed to make such a massive leagues club out of nowhere, but uh, like it, it, it was massive for back then let alone now. So, um, and then, you know, it's a growing area, so they end up with, and it's on the edge of the city, and they end up with the biggest junior base and the most juniors, and, you know, it's the only sport in the area, really, the big-time sport, and there's so many advantages they ended up with. Um, Okay, so he's, he's got some stuff. He's got a few points here that we'll go straight to. Um, he wants to talk about Manchester becoming a focal point of rugby league in the UK. And his, his points, how many years ago? He's two, got two main points here. He says, number one, build a national rugby league stadium in Manchester with a capacity of 30,000, preferably with the roof, with Old Trafford capacity being around 75,000 and Emirates around 50,000. A 30,000 seat stadium fits in nicely, making it an asset for the game that can be utilised year round for all kinds of sporting and entertainment purposes suitable for that capacity. Um, plus who, the roof. Who, it, who pays for that? Well, that's my question. Yeah. Um, I think that, it, I, there's a large reason why um, rugby league clubs, a lot of them, are playing out of soccer grounds. Yeah. The other thing is, too, that, uh, you, you know, investing in a facility that's 30,000 seats and, you know, you'd have to have a team playing. You would want – look, if it was the Rugby Football League playing, paying for it, 
you would want football in every weekend, you know. Yeah. And it, it, you'd you'd want one of the successful teams playing out there. Because you consider that not even Wigan and St Helens are drawing twenty thousand to many mm-hmm. games at all. Mm-hmm. But over thirty thousand seat, you want to be able to at least half fill that thing. And you're not going to do that with yeah. the likes of Lee Centurions playing Huddersfield there. Yeah. I like th- they, they, I think they own the stadium at Bradford at odds, or who knows who owns it. You could build something there, I guess, but then, you know, Bradford, even at their best, are they going to get 20,000 people into it? And can Bradford get to their best? We don't know that yet. And is Bradford accessible to a lot of fans? You, well, yeah, I don't even know that, hey? I don't know. I know it's easy to get to from Leeds and that, but I don't know from other places. Mm. I, the only people that ever have found their way to Bradford are like people from Leeds and the Paul brothers. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the, pro- the problem you're going to have is you're going to need St. Helens fans to go there. Yeah. They don't like travelling. Well, it's all about away fans, isn't it? That's right. Uh, and he says with this new stadium together with maximising Manchester and greater Man- northern Manchester market, Two Manchester Super League clubs will occupy the stadium to create a fierce rivalry and derby that can be exploited. Um, I would elevate the Swint Lions into Manchester Lions, but they tried that though, man. They tried that and yeah, the, the, uh, and and to the credit of the people running the club, they recognised and knew that that was the way they had to go. That was the future, and they got they got ch- thrown out of town. Mm, they had they, death threats and stuff. Yeah. Since. Or having people throwing rocks at them and stuff like that and going, they don't even, they, they struggle to get a thousand people to a game. Mm-hmm. So what's, you, what are they worried about losing? I, I don't know. I really don't know. So I think of it in this, this sense, right? Say St. Mary Saints, who is, a, they're a local, very, very strong local team where I grew up, um, have produced a bunch of internationals, like, Basically, most of the very best Panthers players that went on to be internationals played for St. Mary's at some point. Um, if St. Mary said, we're going to change our name to the Blacktown Saints because we don't want to be a local footy team anymore. We want to be something bigger. You would say, yes, do it. I don't understand why it'd say, no, 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 no. You got to be St. Mary's. You got to be this area. I don't get it. Yeah, Especially if they're playing in the same place. Yeah, there was nothing else changing. The colours were staying the same. They were actually going to keep Swinton's name on the badge. It was just going to be Manchester was the name of the club. Mm. It would just be on there, Swinton, and the year that Swinton started on the badge. They weren't completely scan- canning the whole Swinton thing. But Swinton is... Half of England don't care about what Swinton is. I don't reckon, mean that in a harsh way. I mean it more in the fact that everybody thinks about major centres. Yeah. Swinton isn't a major centre. It's a suburb. Look, if I if I, look, I talk about Mount Druid a lot in the podcast because that's where I'm from, I wouldn't expect most people to be able to point to Mount Druid on a map. You know, most of our listeners wouldn't be able to point to where Mount Druid is inside a map of Sydney. And, and that's fine. Like, you don't have to know where everything is. But if I say Sydney... Fucking everyone knows where that is. Yeah. Although on that point, just yes. to uh, sort of throw it all off a bit, do you know where Wests is? Wests. Yeah. Wests is it's somewhere west of ish. New Zealand. Yeah, ish. Yeah. Westish. Yeah. I mean, they have played some home games in New Zealand, so. <laughs> we'll say I live let's, in. Say let's I, go west of Brazil. Look, I live in Western Sydney, okay? So Wests trains about, I don't know, 40 kilometres east of me. Yeah. All right? And then they play a lot of their games, they play them 30 to 25 kilometres east of me. But then sometimes they'll play 30 kilometres southeast of me, but that's they're right. called Wests. Yeah, that's right. They're West. Yeah. Yeah. 
Anyway, his points are uh, <laughs> Heartland traditional clubs are paramount to the backbone of the competition over there. Uh, Manchester and Greater Manchester is a northern region, a target area. UK Rugby League, 30,000-seat stadium in Manchester. Two Manchester clubs. One of them would be Oldham. One of them would be Swinton. And bonus, change the name Super League to Rugby Football League Premiership. Much more professional in the name and sounds much less tacky and outdated. Leave Super League in the 90s. I kind of agree with that, hey? Yeah, Super League, it's a it's a cartoony type of name. Yeah. And it's, it's just not working. Actually, when I think about it, Super League Rugby, that's what we want them to call it. <laughs> so, yeah, and I won't disclose that, why. That's, that's going to gain momentum. Super League Rugby? Yeah, and fuck me, we're going to be trying to do it ourselves. No, I'm really <laughs> looking forward to Super League Rugby, let me tell you. <laughs> We've got uh, an email here from Nui Ash, who loves oh, writing us. Okay. So he said, uh, feel free to use plenty of controversial terms and abrasive slander when critiquing these predictions. Okay, asshole. Yeah, you fucking dickhead. Um, <laughs> if I don't feel personally vilified by the end of your discussion, I'll be disappointed. <laughs> oh, shit. He's come to the right place. Right. Um, Premiers, Melbourne Storm. And the Clive Churchill winner, Brandon Smith. Oh, this is predictions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, this is bold. Yeah, he's gone out in the limb. Runners up, the Panthers, and he says, sorry, freaky, going back to back is hard. That's what she said. <laughs> Rooster shat on that notion. That's, that's, a, that's old news now. Wooden Spoon, Dragons, and he says, just obje- objectively, a shit housed, I'm not going to say that part, squad. <laughs> Allegedly. Oh, <laughs> oh, man. Best improvers. Bulldogs. The sexiest coach in league finally has a less shit roster. Mm. The worst deteriorators. The Knights. Bottom four contenders. It's not Ooh. happy about that one. Uh, top eight dark horse, the Broncos. Albert Kelly to have a massive season. Mm-hmm. Are, are the Broncos a dark horse for the top eight? Uh, yeah, there's this group of about, I reckon, six or so teams that are going to be pushing for the last two places in the top eight. Mm. I think the Broncos will be pushing to be a part of that group. Yeah. I, th- I don't I think, think they're quite in it. I, I think I think the Broncos are going to make the top eight. Do you? Yeah, yeah, I, I do. I'm not quite convinced that they're... They will this year, but I wouldn't be surprised if they do it next year. Top try scorer, Xavier Coates, and he says, I feel like this is a no-brainer. Massive signing for the Storm. I agree with that. That's a good one. Top point scorer, Ryan Pappenhausen, and he says, if he can remain concussion-free through the season, uh, Super League champions have... Hang on. Getting a fucking email from Pete's Hut asking if they f- I fucking like their pizza. Um, Super League champions haven't seen a game in years because, like many people, I don't care. Why don't they? Why don't they just can the season and play the grand final now between the only two, two, two teams that can win, Wigan and St Helens? He says also could one team possibly cope with the loss of geriatric powerhouses? Aaron Woods, Josh Dugan, and Will Chambers at the same time, compounded by the loss of a quality reserve grade half like Chad Townsend. Cheers, Ash. All right. What what did he start with? What was his first prediction? Premiers. Storm. Storm. Yeah, you know what? I can't say Melbourne. Why not? No. Why not? No, I don't think Melbourne's winning it this year. Why not? Because I don't think they're better than they were last year, and they didn't even make the grand final last year. Okay. Um, I'm finding it very hard to see why Penrith can't do it back to back. I think the thing in Penrith's favour is that they're so young. Yeah. Like it's not even as though they're they're twenty, you know, twenty six, twenty seven. They're like, you know, twenty three, twenty four. Mm-hmm. It's crazy. Yeah. They're they're only going to get better. And you know what? The, the thing that's that works for them, which is it's just something that you can't surpass, is the fact that defensively they're the best team in the comp comfortably. Mm. Comfortably. Um, 
that's important. I, I can't stress how important that is. Yeah. Um, so I can't see them being beat. What was the, what was the next one? Runners up, Panthers. Mm, runners up is tricky. I I don't know which way to go there. Because I don't I again I don't think Melbourne's going to be there. Um. Do you think? Okay, I got a question for you. Because this is something that surprised me a little bit. Do you expect the Roosters to be really, really good this year? I was just about to say they they had a very cruel season last year. Mm-hmm. If they can, if they have a settled squad this year, and it looks like it will be, they can be a huge threat. So, I'm not saying that they will be in the grand final, but it wouldn't surprise me if they make it. Mm-hmm. Um. Just the problem is the teams are around that top top eight region from last season. I don't know how many of those are going to improve dramatically enough mm-hmm. to reach there. And I don't – Souths have not improved their squad. No, they've, they've gotten worse. They've, and it's – you know, you lose Adam Reynolds straight away, you've gotten worse. doesn't matter if everyone else exactly. has stayed. Um. So it, look, it could be a Melbourne Penrith Grand Final or a Penrith Roosters one. I'm, I'm guessing one of those two. What about Parramatta though? <laughs> Next. Okay, let's uh, <laughs> let, let's go to another email. We've got a couple more emails here. I want to finish these predictions. Oh god damn it! I just clicked off of it. Come on, um, I'm halfway through it for fuck's sake. Fuck. Okay, what else was there? Top point scorer. Hang on, let me find him. Let me find him again. I got Top point scorer will be uh, Zach Lomax because all they'll do is kick the ball or pass the ball to him every fucking time and he'll score all the points for the Dragons. And they scored 474 points last year. So if he scores half that, he's going to be the top point scorer. And that's pretty much doable. Wooden top point scorer dra- is, will be Wooden coached. Spoon Dragons. Cowboys. Yeah, I, th- I think the Cowboys, unfortunately. Uh, best improvers. Sharks. Really? Mm-hmm. Wow. I don't think too many teams are going to move a great deal. Yeah. So I reckon Sharks will probably jump up two or three spots on the ladder. I wouldn't be surprised if they have a steady start to the season, but once mm-hmm. they gel, um, I think they're going to have some pretty sharp attack. The defense is still a little bit iffy, mm-hmm. but I think they're going to be the sort of team that could have points in them. Okay. They might just rack up some Super League score lines like winning games 42 to 36 and shit like that. <laughs> <laughs> what about this? I love this category. Worst deteriorators. Uh, yeah, look, the Dragons is probably highly up there. Yeah, I agree. Um, the Titans. The Titans, really? They've lost Jamal Fogarty and haven't replaced him. That worries me. That that's a, me. And I don't think people realise how big an impact that's going to have. Mm. Um, Did you see he's out for four months? Yeah. That sucks for Canberra. It does. Um, I don't I don't know the Knights are going to change that much. I know a lot of people think they're going to slump an awful lot. I'm not too sure they will. Parramatta, yeah. I think they'll, they'll probably still finish around six, but they won't be... They won't be part of the top six. Like last year, they were only um, one one win behind fourth place mm-hmm. and three wins clear of seventh place. I think they'll be closer to seventh place wins-wise than they will be the fifth place this year, and if that makes sense. Yep, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if the Sharks push up around seventh from ninth. And I know it's not talking much change, but I think that's going to be one of the biggest changes that might happen. What about top try scorer? I wouldn't be surprised with Xavier Coates. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't, but that's a, just a great move for both sides. Oh, you too. And the, uh, the only other one that's left is Super League champions. Um, Catalan Dragons. Oh, there we go. It's, it's time they got a new one. Won't happen. They, um, they'll, they'll beat Huddersfield in the grand final. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it'll be in that. Yeah, it'll be. St. Really, Helens will be relegated. Really exciting. <laughs> Uh, okay, let me find because uh, I've got to scroll back up. Okay, we got one here from Lightning McQueenbian, who's another one of our regular emails. Yeah. He says, G'day, cunts. 
Hope yous are well in that. How good is it to have the footy back? Fucking stoked. Yes. Regarding the Eels versus Panthers trial result, do you reckon it's a bit worrying that the Panthers were completely shut out of the game in attack? I know it's only trial, and I know Cleary wasn't playing, so let's move past that and focus on the real question. Do you think this sends a message to the competition to target Cleary more than ever when he returns from injury? To me, it seems they're a bit rudderless when he's not playing, and the better teams can potentially exploit this if he's heavily covered in defence as well. Bring on season 2022. Cheers, Lightning McQueenbian. And he says, P.S., I noticed you've changed the intro song to Mr. Blue Sky by the mighty ELO. Sad that my theme song is not part of the award-winning podcast anymore, but love the song it was replaced by. The last minute or song of the is musical perfection, in my opinion. I don't know what that last sentence means, but we we, we used his, uh, his song in the last episode, too, because I felt bad when I read that. No, I'll leave it. We'll just change it around every now and then. Yeah, felt like mixing it up a bit, hey? Um, look, Parramatta in recent years have been possibly one of the, if not the strongest starting team in the competition at the start of the year. I don't think that's something that you can sneeze at too much. Penrith without Cleary naturally are going to struggle. Um, I, I can't read anything to that result at all. At all. There's nothing I can read into that. I I only saw the second half of that game. Um, hang on, I think I've got another email here. Is this I was going to say, look, Penrith, to be honest, from what I saw, Penrith weren't even trying to run anything like their normal plays. A lot no. of it was about trying to build small combinations in certain parts of the field with players that they know will be on the field. Um, and they weren't they weren't spine players they were making combinations with. They were like, yeah, your left edge and your right edge sort of thing, and just sort of running plays with them. That's pretty much all they were doing. Mm-hmm. So your halves weren't really doing much other than shifting the ball wide to see what, the, what those players can do together. Um it wasn't a normal Panthers structured sort of game from from what I gathered, but you know I didn't watch the whole thing. I saw a few highlights, um, so yeah, I, I really can't read into it. Parramatta are always very strong at the start of the year um, under Brad Arthur, anyway, in recent mm-hmm. times. So I'm I'm not surprised they're hitting the ground running, and I wouldn't be surprised if they come out and again and they've got a dominant record after eight ten rounds. Yeah, I um. I saw the second half, Penrith just forward, hit up, forward, hit up, forward, hit up, forward, hit up, forward. Hit up, forward. They, they really weren't doing much else. They threw the ball wide a little bit before they took, you know, all their first graders off the field. Um, I would say that it was probably, it was probably the sort of performance Parramatta needed over Penrith because Penrith have been dominating Parramatta quite a lot especially when it counts. So I think that they needed to come out and really put one on Penrith's nose. I think it's probably going to be a good thing for Penrith too. You know, they uh, everything they've touched has turned to gold for a long time and all of a sudden Parramatta comes and puts one on them at home in a trial match uh, a couple of weeks out before the season starts. You know, now they know that uh, they're not just going to be able to walk it in this year. So... Um, but in, in the grand scheme of things, it it was more just disappointing in the trial result, which, you know, how disappointed can you be in the trial result? Um, but it, it, I didn't feel like it was a seismic shift, uh, shift in the premiership. No, not at all. I don't think the trials really told us a huge amount. I mean, fuck, the Tigers beat the Roosters. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. Let's not get excited about trial results, shall we? Yeah. Uh, we got hit one here from Sean. He says, uh, hi, guys, your podcast is brilliant. Great topics, and I especially enjoy your contemptuous attitude towards the NRL media. That was very nice of him to say that. Well, I'm, I'm surprised someone picked up on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I thought we were being subtle. Here's one from uh, Lee. He says, hi, freaking Andrew. Thanks for the latest podcast. By the way, he sent this on the 14th of February. Sweet, I like it when we've got uh, good recent content. 
You said you asked, what do we love about the podcast? In a nutshell, I love it because you can say what you want and you swear and both of those attributes bring a passion that you can hear through the Spotify waves. That's cool. You don't pull any punches or suck up to players. If they are shit or a team is not pulling its weight, you actually make it abundantly clear. Plus, it brings a different angle as opposed to what NRL 360 or Talkback. I listen to ABC Andrew Moore. I like his show as well. But Andrew will actually go into play, into a play and say that this player isn't doing this or whatever. And then when I watch it, I don't dissect each play in the way you guys do. And he says, so I am learning from that. And that enables me to clearly communicate that to mates. And he says he's passing on knowledge on what he's learned on the podcast. And he says, I sound like a big shot. LOL, not really. Uh, in my last email about Wayne Bennett, to clarify that, Craig Bellamy CB article stated that Wayne Bennett was inflating the market. Million dollar man equals Milford. I envisage he will be on 500,000 at the Dolphins. I can't believe you, uh, I can't believe you guys support long contracts. With the exception of Jason Tomalolo, you can name off many others that ripped clubs off. Josh Dugan, Jack Bird, Woods. Okay, can't think of any others right now, but I know they are out there. Keep up the great podcast, and if I agreed with everything you guys said, it wouldn't be as interesting. That's true. Thanks for entertaining me while I'm at work. Well, that's no really nice to hear, Lee. Thank you uh, for that. Anyway. The reason I'll tell you this, guy. Okay? The reason why we support long contracts is we support the players getting the best possible deal for themselves because the the clubs are not going to give them the best possible deals. Mm-hmm. So the players need to get do that for themselves. So if they get a deal where they get job security and a good pay for as long as possible, yeah, we support that. But that's not to say that they had the right decisions for the club. But if the club signs off on it, then that's the fucking club's fault. It's not the players' fault. Yeah, and, and, and look, I, I tend to think that there are some players I would give them as long a contract they would want. Like, uh, I would do that with Cleary. I would do that with Ponga. I would do that with Tamalolo. Um, you know, there's certain, there's just certain players, you know, you're going to get a good deal out of if you sign them long term. Yeah. And I think when you look at some of the players that are, have had long term contracts that have been bad, like Jack Bird, I remember hearing about Jack Bird when he was just breaking into first grade, and they were saying how he had, um, I think it was rheumatoid arthritis as yeah. a youngster. And I straight away thought, man, that's a red flag right there. Um, but the but, thing is, though, those first few seasons that he was at the Sharks, he was an absolute handful for opposition defences. Even when they could figure out the way he was going to run, they still couldn't stop him. Mm. He just had that... Um, but really strong drive through the hips. And so if someone were going to try and tackle him around the legs, he could bump him off, um, but also strong around the shoulders. So he was just a really awkward sort of bloke to have in the in the back line because he did have a decent passing game as well. The problem they had is that he was generally a very, a very decent centre. When the Broncos bought him for a premium price, they went, well, for paying top dollar, we need this bloke with the ball in his hand as often as possible. They tried to put him into the halves. Didn't quite work. You can do it with some players. Jamie Lyon, for example. You can move from centre to 5 eighth and it'll work. But Jack Bird wasn't that sort of player. He was just a run player, not so much a bloke who could create. Um, and so that's where the problem came. And so they then start thinking, where else can we put him? Let's put him in the forwards. You go, well, you know, if he's got that fragility in the past and put him in the forwards all that contact that can get pear-shaped yeah and you know injuries started to follow and i'm glad to see that the dragons were at least smart enough to, in some aspects to realize that he just needs to play at center i know they moved him around a bit but it seems like they're, they're settling on him being a center more than anything else which is the smart thing to do with him because you need especially with the way the dragons are at the moment they're just sending everything out to lomax side at least if you've got Bird on the other side, you got two targets, you know. It's yeah. a bit harder for a defensive team to work out. I tell you what, though, I, I know it's a philosophy I would go by is that if a player is injury prone or has those sorts of physical red, red flags, I just wouldn't sign them no matter how good they were. 
Um, I, ju- I just think that I put a premium on players that you can select and know they're going to be there every week and that problem's taken care of. Um, and and I, I just think that investing in a player that, has that potential to be, I mean, he, what, he missed like a season and a half at one point. Yeah. And, and then there was another season he missed. It's, it's like, and it's nothing against him personally. It's just as a club, I, I wouldn't personally do that. I wouldn't invest in a play with that sort of history. Um, but you know, some clubs don't have the luxury of passing on players. Mate, with that attitude, you'll never ever be working for the West Tigers. I know, right? <laughs> I mean, the Tigers have re-signed Jacob Little about three or four times, and both times he was out for like 12 months with injuries. Yeah. I can't wait until they sign uh, the fucking turnstile from Canberra, hey? Oh, I'll give him another three or four years. Yeah. Um, now, some news. Kevin Walters has signed a contract extension for the Brisbane Broncos, uh, and it takes him through to the end of 2023. So they only gave him a one-year extension. What do you reckon about that? Um, you know, I don't mind it because mm-hmm. I think the worst thing you can do with the club that's done the rebuild and they're moving forward is to um have an axe kind of hanging over the coach's head after he's done the hard graft. Yeah. Um. So giving him that extra year means that this year he can focus on setting the team up and getting them on the improve. And all he's got to focus on this year is fixing their defense because even in last year there are times when he just – it was just fucking rank. He did help. He did definitely help it a lot, though. Yeah. By the end of the season, things were a lot better, a mm. lot better. Mm. Um. So he's got that to build upon. If he can get the Broncos up around tenth, eleventh place as a bare minimum, mm-hmm. that's setting a really good base for him to work on in 2023, where he can get them back into the eight and earn a decent contract extension of two or three years. And I think that's pretty much where he's going to be looking at. I think if the Broncos right now try and go too far and have too bold a plan and go, right, we're going to get back in the finals this year, the pressure of trying to do that might be too much because they've now got a, a rather young squad. And the problem you've got with having too bold a plan is it may put too much pressure on them and they may crumble and they don't go anywhere. So if you make the make the goal a solid improvement and get them around 10th, 11th place. They'll be in contention for the, for the finals. They might just get there, but focus on getting close. And next year, the goal is then we get into the eight. And I think that's a smarter way of managing it. And I, and I wouldn't be surprised if that's the way um, Kevy's looking at it to try and keep the pressure off his players. Mm-hmm. Now, now on a different note, Trent Robinson extended his contract at the Sydney Roosters to the end of 2028. Of course you would. <laughs> of course so you I, would. Saw, I saw a lot of talk during the week saying he is very close to being the best coach of all time. What do you reckon about that? Because I think that's bullshit. Not of all time. I'll put him in the, I'll put him in the top 10 Yeah. for all-time coaches. Absolutely. But not, not the best all-time. Not while Craig Bellamy still exists. Not while Wayne Bennett's still around. I thought Not while Arthur Holloway still exists in the past, who's still won more premierships than any other coach. People yeah. forget that. Yeah. Um, it, it just seemed like a lot of ass kissing Yeah. Look, as I said, I don't mind putting him in the top 10. I think he'd be comfortable in there somewhere, but uh, not the best of all time. No. Now, this week, the NRL come out with its uh, NRL advert, which is always highly anticipated to see what you're going to be watching randomly pop up at 3 a.m. on your TV if you still watch TV. Um, And it is basically the whole theme is rugby league. It's unreal. And I know you've seen it. Yeah. What were your thoughts on this unreal advert? Um, I thought it was – I thought it looked a bit cheap. Yep. It was corny. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. A little cringe. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And – at the end of the day, rugby league is a really easy game to advertise, yet the NRL constantly finds ways to make it really complicated. Yeah. Just show some highlights of the game being played. That's highlights all you've got to do. Highlights and music. That's it. That's it. That's it. Some rock or metal music and highlights. It's it, really that simple. It's not complicated. You know what? Fox Sports manages to do it every year. 
yeah, they don't faff about with all this extra stuff. It's nuts. I know a lot of people were critical of, um, was it two years ago, Latrell Mitchell with the Aboriginal flag. I had no issue with that. That's mm. fine. Mm. But you don't need to be constantly waving all of this social commentary in our faces in an advert for a sport. Oh, I don't I mind, I don't mind that. that they want to do this this social stuff. I've got no issue with that. Mm. But at the end of the day, you, you, you're running a sport and you're promoting a sport. Just focus on that. you just got to sell the sport. What they're doing at the moment is going too far into the social matters. And while they are important, they're not, they're not what makes rugby league rugby league. What makes rugby league rugby league is what gets played on the field. And the fact what we do on the field is everyone gets treated like everybody else. There's no different, you know, we don't, we don't look at different races and different groups and comment on them based on that. No. We look on players and we talk about what they do on the field and their ability and their performance, what makes them great. None of that conversation comes about their race, their religion, their sex, their sexuality, any of that. Yeah. We don't look at that. We take them all and judge them all on their ability on the field as footballers and that's it. If that's not, if that's not harmonious enough, I don't know what is. I also think that like, you know, it reminded me of a pro, like the intro to a videotape that you would show in for to a bunch of eight year old kids at a coaching clinic. Like it, it's felt like it was put together on that sort of level. Yeah, yeah. And, and when it started up with basically Ray Warren and showing the fucking like what the Channel Nine fucking behind the scenes shit, and I'm like, this isn't rugby league. This is as far from rugby league as you get. And then it shows a little bit of game footage and then it's showing kids running around and all this sort of stuff. And it's like, I was like, you, I was like, just show NRL footage and music. If you want to promote junior rugby league, make an advert for that. If you want to promote women's rugby league, make an advert for that. Like if they're that important, do that. But to try and make this all encompassing ad and it come out garbage. I think it's one of the worst ads we've ever seen just because it was so bland and there was, there, it was just a nothing advert, you know? Yeah. Well, at the end of the day, they were, they were actively promoting their social causes. Mm. And I've got no issue, no issue whatsoever with their social causes. I, I agree with all of them. I genuinely do. But the advert shouldn't be about promoting those. You've got all year to promote that stuff and talk about it. You've got specialized rounds for all that stuff, which I think is another good thing. That's when you do that sort of stuff and you make it a week long campaign about that stuff, which is more important. Try to put that in cramming that into an ad where you're promoting a sport and nothing else. It's clunky and it just doesn't work. You can't mix social, you know, social changes and all these sort of things you want to do and somehow correlate it with sport being played. Doesn't matter what sport it is. You can't talk about the importance of the, um, LGBTQI group while watching someone score a try. It's, yeah. It doesn't correlate on a TV screen, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And yeah, that's and the problem. They're trying to do that, and it doesn't work. You've just got to pick one lane, right? And the lane is, we've got sport. Let's promote it and just show the game being played by people. That's yeah. it. Doesn't matter what they look like. Doesn't matter who they are. Doesn't matter who they root. Doesn't matter. Watch them play football. That's what people want to see because they don't worry about the rest of the stuff. And, you know, one of the things, I hate it when you go to sit down and watch game footy, right? And you just get beaten over the head with all these different causes, right? And I'm not saying that they're not justified causes. I'm really not. I'm not saying I'm against any of them. But when you just want to sit down and watch a game of footy, and all of a sudden somebody's telling you that you you should get checked for cancer. It's like, man, I just want to watch the Panthers play. <laughs> Can we just chill with the cancer talk, you know? I understand that there's that it's charities and all this sort of stuff. I understand that. I'm not saying it's a bad thing and look, it's not for me and you no know, plenty of people get stuff out of it. But there's just sometimes I just want to sit down and watch footy and it feels like people are trying to give me all of these fucking lessons instead. And an ignorant person like me doesn't want lessons, Andrew. I want to live in ignorant bliss. Is that understandable? Well, that's fair enough. I want to um, walk through life not realising that everything's fallen apart for two hours while I watch a game of fucking football. I, I look, 
the one thing I love about sport, um, especially rugby league at the moment too, more you know, is it can transcend all of these matters which people try and bring conflict amongst. Yes. As I said before, look, we don't see we don't see Latrell Mitchell and think, oh, he's an Aborigine. We see Latrell Mitchell and go, he's a superstar. Yeah. Um, you know, and I love the fact that we do that. We've transcended the things that divide us, and we're just watching brilliant athletes playing sport brilliantly, and that's what we watch. And uh, that's what I love about the game. We sit there and we watch the women's rugby league, and we go, oh, look at these little girls trying to play. We go watch it and go, they are fucking good at this. I watched it today. It was fucking amazing. Yeah. And we legitimately talk constantly about how we enjoy watching it, not because they're women, but because the spirit they play it in yeah. is better than what the what we constantly see all the time in the NRL. You know, when they have a handover, they don't sit there and hide it behind their back or kick the ball away or be some, do some childish bullshit. They just give it to the opposition. And it's the thing simple is, little things, but it's yeah. it's it takes the frustration out of the game. You're going right now. We're watching pure football as it was meant to play. You know, be played. Yeah. That's the thing I like, the, the thing I like about the women's game too, is it's like there was there's pro, there's probably people that wanted to turn it into a I, I don't know a, a fucking non-stop social justice lesson, right? Where they they're pushing all this stuff and they're trying to say, well, see, this is the this is how it should be, blah blah blah, and and the fucking players don't do that one fucking bit. They go out there and they beat the fuck out of one another. <laughs> they play really good footy. They know how to play footy. They know how to read defense. They know how to kick the ball. They know how to catch. They know, they know how to be, they're footy players. And you don't watch it thinking, well, you know, this is, this is just, you know, a PR stunt or it's subsidized by the men's game to try and get women watching sport. You're not thinking that for a damn second. You, you you're like, Oh shit. Did you see that hit? Oh, man, you see that pass? Like, it's the best women's sport to watch by, like, so far. And th- there's just, they, they're just footy players. Like, they're not, they're not trying to be something else. They're just footy players, you yeah. know? Like, yeah. I saw an interview today on Fox Sports, and it was a, a Dragons player, and I can't remember her name. But uh, the interviewer asked, you know, is Jamie Sow had helped with kick and game. And she was like, I've been playing footy all my life. Like, yeah, you know, it's great to have Jamie Sowd around, but I've been kicking a football since I was a little girl, <laughs> you know? They're just footy players, like, and that's all they care about. There's no other shit with it. And I love that about it, that I can sit down and watch a women's game and it's literally just a game of footy. Yeah, and they're footy players. They're not yeah. a race, they're not a religion, they're not a sexuality, they're just footy players. That's how we see them. Yeah, they might be all those other things as well, but we don't we don't separate them by that. We separate them by the fact that they're footy players. We're not. Yeah, <laughs> we like watching play. We like watching play footy because that's what they do good. Mm. It, it really is quite simple. It's almost um, it's almost the way children look at other kids. So they don't look at another child and see a different skin color or a different religion or a different type of clothes or yeah any of that. They just see another person. Yeah, and that's that is genuinely the beauty of sport is that it it transcends all those divisive groups that a lot of people get buried down in, which is all fucking stupid. They just watch athletes playing the sport they love. That's it. I, I remember when I was a, a kid in school in primary school, and uh, I I was a primary school kid in Mount Druitt. My friends were like Tongan, Samoan, Fiji, and Aboriginal. You know, the, the white kids as well, but it was just like, it just, you know, mixes from everywhere. And I thought that's how everyone went to school like that. I literally thought that was everyone's school life. And then I went to a school that was a little bit outside the area. And there was only like, there was one Tongan kid in my whole grade and a couple of Aboriginal kids. And I was like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> it was so weird to me because I just thought every, like every, Every place was like where I'd gone to primary school, and it wasn't. It was it was really strange when I found that out, because I, I wasn't thinking about it. Like we used to play footy, touch footy in primary school, and 
we'd all swear at each other in all of these different languages and all these. Uh, so, like, we would swear at each other in Samoan and Tongan and stuff like that, playing footy and just loving it. And you, you just, it wasn't about anyone's skin colour or anything. We were just all friends and stuff. And, it, like, I see that in rugby league. Like, it's, it's just... I don't ever think like it's that's why I find it weird when I watch Super League and they'll say that oh so and so's a Scottish international or it's this player's a an Italian international and I don't even think of that sort of stuff they're just footy players you know fully agree fully agree um so yeah, yeah we can't really stress it anymore it's just so at the end of the day I think that NRL ad it's try hard Yes. They need to get back to the basics of just, you know, seriously, I, I'm not I'm not going to say this too often. Just let Fox Sports do it. Yeah. You know, one of the best footy ads I ever remember seeing, I don't know if you would have even seen this, and I think it was, I feel like it was due or just after Super League, there was a Nike ad with Gordon Tallis and Andrew Johns in it, and it was just footy with music. And it was a really good advert. No, that one always stands out for me. But, you know, the best one ever, simply the best. And it's, you know, you're simply the best. And it's game footage. And that's it. Yep. That's all you need. That's all you need. It's so show some show some fans at a leagues club cheering. And that's it. Yeah. Brilliant. I don't know how they get this so hard. Yeah, I don't get it. I think it's just that. And I bet that advert cost a shitload of money too, hey? So really, at the end of the day, the only race they are are rugby league players. And let's be honest, that's the supreme race. That's true. The only race we want in rugby league really is between Josh Adokar, Martin Offia, uh, who else? Aaron Woods. <laughs> Aaron Woods. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Why not? Why not? Um that's a pretty good episode. We've managed to get all the emails out of the way. Mm-hmm. Yep. Clean um, slate. Yeah. People, please send more. Yeah. You send that. them to podcast at leaguefreak.com. That's what you're going to do. Um, and inundate us with them, please. Yeah. Do um, the subject as podcasts so they jump out at me too. That would be great. There's an idea. Um, also, everyone, be prepared. Uh, I did see this on Twitter today. Um you're going to get a barrage of, uh, you know, promos and stuff this week on Fox Sports and KO from our old mate. But how about this bloke? How about this bloke? Um, have, have you ever seen a guy play football like this? Yeah, I have. But yeah. still. He just knows footy. He's just he woke a- up. Some people said he woke up with the football under his arm. All I gotta say is that must have been really painful for his mother. <laughs> oh jeez. Um yes. And on that note, make sure you check us out on the socials, people. We're at uh LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, MySpace. all those places. MySpace, yeah. Um check us out on Instagram and Twitter at Virgo Freak Pod. Um Make sure you subscribe and like all the videos over at YouTube. You can leave comments over there. That'll be probably something we'll get into next is reading the comments over there. Um, later on this week, there will be another episode. It's going mm. to be our season preview. and It's going to be a fucking whopper. Yeah, all the season previews so far that you've heard on your podcast and app. They're, they're just warming shit. you up. Well, they're, they're just warming you up. They're crap compared to what we're going to do. Oh, well, that's, that's true. That's true. They're they've just, much. all they've done is they've, They've wet your appetite, and now we're just going to give you the fucking banquet. Exactly. Um, so we'll do that. <laughs> Make sure you join the footy tip and competition, the NRL, Fergo on the Freak footy tip and competition. You can get details at com. Very easy to join. It's free. You get a The winner will get a 3D printed trophy, which will be really cool, a custom made one. Um, there's about 70 people in the competition so far, so keep joining be part of the action. We're going to talk about it when we do um, some of our shows during the week, during the season. So we'll oh, yeah. give you updates as to where people are and the big moves and stuff like that. Sounds like a great idea. Mm. And um, yeah, that's about it, isn't it? Pretty much. Hey, if you want to check out some of my 3D prints, go to my Instagram page, 
the glorious league freak. So that's Instagram.com slash the glorious league freak. And uh, I've been making sure that I don't hang shit on any of them. So you can bask in the glory of them all. Oh, isn't that nice? You've stopped <laughs> fucking bullying me on Instagram. Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, you know, I've done my bit to try and help get a bit of traffic go your way. I think. Probably <laughs> not. <laughs> all it was doing was breaking me down mentally. That's all. Just chip away at you. Yeah. Well, that's how you do it, isn't it? You've got a few feet to lose. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks for tuning in, everyone. Um, and make sure you stay tuned this week. Uh, midweek will be our next big episode. Um, yeah, we'll catch you then. <laughs>